Hi guys, just a quick note before I get into these books. I, I want to thank you for your kindness from my last video. I should have known from how kind all of you are that me speaking about mental health would would elicit that sympathy and I, I think it can only be a good thing if we're all especially sympathetic toward one another right now. But in the interest of keeping the video length down, I edited out certain aspects of what I, I was getting at that I think in hindsight were important for what I was trying to say more broadly, which is that in a time of crisis, being okay is not the norm anymore. And that in itself is not something we should feel so responsible for individually. There are still things we can do for our mental and physical health, significant things, but happiness and productivity are not permanent states of being solely controlled by the individual. All of us, to varying degrees, are not okay right now. And I think that there can be a sort of collective power to admitting that. So down to business. I've decided that since I'm buying so few books in 2020, I may as well highlight those chosen few. So these are going to be the first three books that I bought this year, which are Border by Kapka Kasabova, Actress by Anne Enright, and Bloodlands by Timothy Snyder. All three are fantastic. I've hit a, a dud or two since, but this first video is going to be a pure recommendations video. Kasabova is from Bulgaria but has lived in Scotland for a number of years and in this she travels to the border areas shared by Bulgaria, Turkey, and Greece. The book is loosely separated into three sections based on her observations in each country but I say loosely because one of the prevailing themes is the mixture of histories, landscapes, and cultures. How fraught it is to categorize to say this thing is Greek or, or this person is or is not Bulgarian. Mostly this is sketches of the people and places that she encounters, the, the local families, agriculture, landmarks, and languages, and everything is treated with this real deliberate specificity. There's so much variety within each country with no one national character or backdrop. One story I keep thinking about is from a woman named Aisha who was part of the wave of so-called Bulgarian Turks who were expelled from the country in 1989. It says, Aisha and her sisters didn't speak Turkish. They only found out they were Turks when the police knocked on their door. Impossible not to think of yellow stars. The exodus of 340,000 people with families, futures, and sometimes bodies broken by their own state was the largest movement of people in Europe since World War II, and it happened in peacetime. The book then goes on to describe Aisha, her mother, and her two sisters loading up a cart and walking to the border, and how Aisha was threatened for speaking Bulgarian, and so for a time she fell between languages, as the book phrases it. Um, and it's funny because still to this day in Turkey, she's viewed as you know, too Bulgarian, but in Bulgaria she's viewed as Turkish, and that's all beyond her control, beyond her self-definition. Kasabova tends to record more than she editorializes, but she is a presence in the narrative mostly through the tone of it. There's something about these locations, like they're loaded with a certain atmosphere to her. There's a sense of their history, like a charge in the air, and at times she's clearly unsafe as well. So this is an homage to these places, but it's not travel brochure. There's an ominous and sometimes mystical edge to the appreciation of these borderlands. Ultimately what I found so intelligent about this book is the way it teases out the tension in the lived reality of arbitrary concepts. You can interrogate conflicting definitions of identity and how and why borders are drawn on a map, but the fact is that people have died for those identities and for trying to cross those borders during the Cold War, people were shot for attempting to leave the Soviet sphere through Bulgaria. Conversely, whole communities have been forcibly moved across these essentially made-up lines because of their perceived religion or ethnicity. So in the end, even as you know borders and identities shift throughout history, the effects of these concepts in any particular time and place can make them more real than anything else. Actress is the first novel I bought this year and it's a high standard. Enright is a Booker Prize winning Irish writer. Actress is her seventh novel and the second for me after The Green Road. This is from the perspective of a middle-aged woman named Nora looking back on the life of her mother who was a famous Irish actress and looking back on their relationship. 
So already we're checking several boxes. I like mother-daughter reflections, and I also gravitate toward stories that involve the psychology of acting, especially in terms of in-person theater. There's something evergreen about these questions of duality and suspension of disbelief and play acting on stage mirroring the way we play act in our lives. Catherine O'Dell, the narrator's mother, had a very successful but up and down career spanning from about the late 1940s to the 80s and that career ended officially in a shocking way. You learn this early on. Nora winds in and out of her mother's bio and one of the first things you learn is that her mother was actually English. One of 20th century Ireland's leading figures and stars in, in the world of this book, that is, was originally English and nobody else knew. So already you have this layering of truth and perception. But what I want to stress about this novel right out of the gate is that Emrate avoids the narrative beats you might expect. This isn't a narrator who's resentful toward her mother. And in fact, Nora has this unexpected security in their relationship, in the truth and warmth of what existed between the two of them. And she views her mother in a somewhat idealized, but predominantly loving, way. Also, there, there's the interesting dynamic that from a young age, unlike most children, Nora has had an awareness that her mother also belongs to the world more generally. So there's this cyclical sense of losing her and getting her back, losing her and getting her back, but in a way that, that's quite subtle. There's very little rancor or a sense of betrayal toward the parts of her mother that she can't know. And as the reader, you are limited by Nora's knowledge. So for example, there's a priest that her mother is very close to, but you don't actually learn much about that relationship or what it entailed. Sometimes she'll speculate about things, but there's also this respect for the hidden parts of a person, and the book more broadly touches on what it sees as, as a bygone sense of respect for the privacy of public figures. I find it especially interesting that this novel isn't cynical about acting or about Catherine O'Dell's ability to change behind the eyes, as Nora puts it at one point. There are some lovely moments on this, like when Nora mentions that her mother used to stop in front of the mirror on her way out until she got this look that said to herself, there you are. Jumping around a little, here are some other moments based on the cover from Nora waiting in the wings for her mother to finish a performance. I don't know whether I went back to the dressing room who took me there or brought me home, but I do remember, and vividly, the wind of her coming off stage, she was crackling with the attention of the crowd. And still they clapped. How was that? She said. Was it all right? Yes. I would like to note here that a grown woman asked a five-year-old girl to tell her that her performance was not a disaster, to reassure her and to praise. I know this is true because she always did it. And I said, famously, I thought you were an angel. I thought I was dead and gone to heaven. She loved this, of course, and told the story often though she left out the bit about my being dead. Nora's intended audience for these recollections is her husband of 30 years. She's writing it with him in mind, and despite their long-term commitment to each other, they have this push-and-pull relationship that you see snatches of. So in some ways, her stable, domestic life is the antithesis of her mother's single parenthood, traveling around the world, numerous lovers, lifestyle. But the book doesn't treat either life trajectory like it's simple, and both mother and daughter end up exploring sex and power and the performance of womanhood in their own ways. I will say that the pronounced subtlety of this book has slightly worked against it in terms of it staying with me after a single reading. Flipping through a, a few sections in preparation for the video, I had one of those moments where I was like, oh yeah, I... I enjoyed this even more than I, I remember, but Enright's writing is just pristine. And as I said in my Women's Prize chat with Matthew, compared to most other authors, this writing is the difference between drawing your hair yourself and getting a professional blowout. Finally, let's talk about Bloodlands. Saved the cheer for last. When historians approach the behemoth, that is World War II, they tend to select an entry point. So for some, this can be major figures. These are your Churchill, Hitler, Stalin, Roosevelt type books. For others, it can be particular battles, 
specific countries, isolated time frames, or, or moments when the war was supposedly won or lost, Snyder is an American historian, and his entry point is geography. He cordons off this section of Eastern Europe that he calls the Bloodlands, where between 1933 and 1945, 14 million people were murdered by the regimes of Stalin and Hitler. This book takes that number, 14 million deaths, and looks at the how, the when, and the why. Snyder ties together events that are often treated as separate. So we start in 1933 with the, the Ukrainian famine, and then we move to various Soviet purges involving both executions and the gulag system, POW camps, so-called. The, the truth is that if you were a Soviet prisoner of war under control of the Germans, you weren't treated like a typical prisoner of war. It was a, a death sentence of its own. The Holocaust is included, and Snyder has an interesting reframing of the Holocaust that I'm not going to get into because he has a whole book on this topic that I plan to read called Black Earth. He also explores the experiences of, mostly of civilians during the war and how they were targeted by each occupying regime, moves on to ethnic cleansings after the war, and also briefly touches on anti-semitism in the war's wake. It's a lot. It's a lot to absorb. But I, I really found that it was a huge benefit to have this juxtaposition of events I thought I was familiar with and those that were either partial or total unknowns to me. It's not a new concept to compare and contrast the regimes of Stalin and Hitler. The Soviet journalist and novelist Vasily Grossman was arguably one of the first to do so soon after the war. But Snyder's accomplishment here is twofold. One, he argues that in order to understand World War II and the Holocaust, we need to approach them from the East, not the West. And two, more critically for me, he discusses the full impact across the geography of this space. This is not a turn your gaze from Germany to Russia book. We focus a fair amount on Poland, but the sections that contributed the most to broadening my conception of this war were the ones on the Baltic states, Ukraine, and Belarus. Let's talk about Ukraine for a second because Good God, even if you don't read this whole book, I strongly urge you to read the first chapter on the Ukrainian famine of 1933. It is insane. I haven't been able to stop thinking about it since I read this. So if you have recommendations for books solely on this topic, please leave them below. Snyder takes you through this point by point, how this was a product of collectivization, sure, but how every time this could have been turned back, Stalin and the Soviet government pushed it forward how they set impossible quotas for the first few harvests. And then, shocker, when those quotas weren't met, the way they punished these Ukrainian farmers was by taking some of their seed for the next harvest and, oh, by taking their food. And then when, shocker, they didn't meet the next quotas and started to starve en masse, Stalin continued shipping their crops to other areas of the Soviet Union, barred them from the city so they couldn't beg, took away their passports so they couldn't leave, and set up watchtowers nearby. And then, as millions, millions of people were starving in agony under the eye of their government, Stalin took offense and thought, why are they doing this to me? Why do they hate communism so much that they're sabotaging it in this way? Deadly, deadly insanity. Then the experiences of Ukraine and Belarus during the war were new to me, and I want to stress that that's largely by design. Here are some excerpts on this. Russia is fast. The Germans never even aimed to colonize more than its western fifth, and never conquered more than its western tenth. Yet Stalin's idea contained a purposeful confusion. The war on Soviet territory was fought and won chiefly in Soviet Belarus and in Soviet Ukraine, rather than in Soviet Russia. More Jewish, Belarusian, and Ukrainian civilians had been killed than Russians. The deported Caucasian and Crimean peoples, for that matter, had seen a higher percentage of their young people die in the Red Army than had the Russians. Jewish soldiers had been more likely to be decorated for valor than Russian soldiers. Given the centrality of the Second World War to the experience of all East Europeans, everyone in the new communist Europe would have to understand that the Russian nation had struggled and suffered like no other. Russians would have to be the greatest victors and the greatest victims, now and forever. In my experience, that conflation of Soviet and Russian 
has been almost total in the United States when we discuss World War II. And Russians suffered tremendously, like no one is disputing that. But we are, are all still subject to a purposeful muddying of the waters when it comes to the major stories of the Eastern Front. Overall, Snyder's writing is, is, is very clear and has this momentum to it that drove me to keep reading, even as horrors were piling on horrors. Some nonfiction is narrative or novelistic. This isn't. This is straight history writing dealing heavily with facts and figures and arguments. But like I said, there's a clarity to the overall presentation that helps me walk away with serious food for thought, even from one reading of a, a fairly packed book. Thank you for watching. Do let me know what you think about any of these titles, and I'll see you soon.